have to enable this in, um, in your preferences? Or? No, this is something where all you have to do is add just a little extra bit of code to the URL, yeah. and it automatically runs it for you. So you won't get any auto you want. Something really useful like uh, find an archaeology article and add an archaeology resource from Scarf or IDS or something like that. Yeah, um, so I had to do what I'm hoping to do is to something like these ones. The ones that just put this in for you, so you can't do it. So I'll rather do this with my personal list. Just for you to ask you for the editing article. I guess it did it somewhat.
like like watching the presentation and not watching the talk. Those who don't present it. When we talk, I'm not the front desk.
of representation of works for which copyright is expired, the public domain works in the public domain by not any rights yet. Um, one minute, oh shit. Uh, sorry. <laughs>
experience, right? Well, it's complicated. Um, it's complicated. Uh, this is what the this is what the page from the uh, dictionary looks like. Uh, I know you all have very good Hebrew, so um, just just take a look. Oh wait, we're not actually seeing the whole picture. Here. Yeah, I don't think so. Well, you should have to believe me that there really are four equal columns in here. Uh, I guess. Anyway, uh, it's it's a um, wall of text, shall we say? And uh, but it looks like a dictionary, right? You recognize this, right? These are headwords and dictionary, and there's footnotes and stuff. Um, there's a time text, and <laughs> in the part that you cannot see. <laughs> Okay, so just imagine an arrow pointing to the, to the right of that column over there. But the point is that uh, entries don't necessarily begin, you want to try and fix this. Entries don't necessarily begin at the top of the column, right? So a page begins like in the middle of some previous entry. And this is the incantation that will fix this. <laughs> Um, 
can do is just click between the definitions and the system will automatically cut and, and prepare those little changes. And this is what a single short uh, entry looks like, for example. Oh, please for a JPEG? Yes, so it takes the ginormous JPEG files, you just click a couple of times between the definitions and the system does the rest including taking that last bit of the definition from the previous page and connecting it to that piece. And that's all uh, very magically sorted out for you. Um, and so if you're given this, I hope you'll agree, this is a digestible, manageable, clearly delineated piece of work to transcribe. This is a complete definition. It's a short one. Definitions can be four columns long. But if there were four columns of the definition, yeah. how do you put it in one column? Or one and a half? How do you put it uh, in the right position for you? Uh, the system will let you cycle through each part. So you, you type the first little bit, and then you say I'm done, and then you scroll to the next little uh, bit. I will demonstrate this in a moment. Um, and uh, from that moment, everything else happens at the level of the entry, not a page. And so uh, the bulk of the work is in your browser, web-based system, you just transcribe what you see. Uh, if you can't type Arabic, and most Hebrew speakers cannot, uh, you can mark it. You can say, well, there's a bit of Arabic here. You just flag that for someone else, another volunteer who can type Arabic, who can, just, who can then sort of do only the fix-ups. So the, the, the few volunteers who can type Arabic or Greek can go and complete those little words of Arabic and Greek in the dictionary that other people have typed the rest of. Uh, and again, the system manages this because it's at the individual definition level. The entries move through these rounds of proofreading and eventually are published. And that means that parts of the dictionary are already available even though we're far from done transcribing the entire dictionary. Whatever single entry is already fully proofread is already available. And this is what the, the, the bulk of the work looks like. As you can see, the as you can see, I am a master web designer. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. Uh, the user gets this piece of, of uh, definition, this scan on the right, on the top right. And what they need to do is type the head word, the, the actual word being defined, in here in this little edit box. And then transcribe the uh, body of the definition onto this little edit box, including, uh, this is rich text, so including bold, uh, where, where the dictionary emphasizes words. And then you also transcribe the footnotes separately. There's a good technical reason that I won't go into to sort of do this separately, to make it very easy um, without markup and ref tags and things, uh, to just type the uh, footnotes as you see them. And uh, like I said, sometimes the even though the arc, this entry is very short, as you can see, it ends at the bottom line there. But the footnote is very long, and it may continue on the other column originally. And so you get this little button here, uh, this little button, which allows you to scroll just the footnote part. Like, give me the, the rest of the footnotes from the other column, even though this definition is, has ended in this column. Does that make sense? It's a little complicated. Yes. Um, and finally, these little buttons here allow you to say what you have not been able to take care of. Like, oh, there's Arabic here, there's Greek here, and you flag it for that other volunteer to fix up after you. And there's also, because I am a Wikipedian, a little bit of markup here. Um, you may notice um, that this, this part here in the parentheses, which is equally unreadable to you, is in a slightly different script. Do you notice that? No. Okay. <laughs> you have to take my word for it. So this is standard uh, Hebrew, uh, so-called Assyrian uh, script. And this is an alternative Hebrew script called Rashi script. Um, and this, this change of typeface was used by the author of the dictionary to mark uh, references, citations. So every definition that is, um, that is uh, given the author of the dictionary also provides biblical Talmudic citations, right? About how this word was used throughout history. And these citations are marked in this way in the text. And in our transcription, 
if you pay, if you look very closely, you will see a bit of markup that is maybe familiar, double square brackets, uh, that marks this same bit of text in the transcribed version. The reason we do this is that it allows us to render a complete entry, right, for the readers in this way. So all these little uh, blue links are precisely those citations. You see? And the system was able to uh, format them differently and, and call them out to you because the volunteers who transcribe it put those little bits of markup around it to mark the fact that it is a citation. And in fact, um, and in fact, if you click on one of these, wait, I'll, I'll make that a surprise. First of all, um, first of all, this is what the complete dictionary looks like. So, um, or rather, the accumulating dictionary looks like. So, these are these are complete uh, short art entries. And as you can see, between this entry and that entry above it, you see these three dots, this ellipsis, which is your way of knowing that some definitions between those two, one or a hundred, are not yet ready. They're still being proofread or, or typed, etc. But you already have these other definitions. And this is important because you, you need to know at least the fact that uh, with this here, right, between this entry and that entry, there are no other entries. So if you're looking for a word that alphabetically is between those two, you know this dictionary doesn't have it. Do you understand? That, and, and so this lack, this, this uh, marker of a, of a gap is useful so that you at least know that, yes, there are other words here between those two. They're just not ready yet. Uh, these are permalinks. So that if you need to, uh, you know, settle uh, a bar bet or win an argument, can uh, take the permalink directly to that entry and paste it at someone else uh, and send me 10% of what we uh, win. Um, and so um, if you do click one of those uh, citations, <coughs> drum roll please. Familiar? It's Hebrew, but you know the logo. Wikisource! Uh, if you click that link, uh, and it's and, and the citation that the dictionary author was citing from the Bible, from the Talmud, from classical Hebrew literature is available online. It'll take you right there to that particular, in this case it's the Bible, it takes you to that particular verse in the Bible on the Hebrew wiki source automatically. So no volunteer had to like, provide this link. The what? system parses the citation and goes, oh yes, I know, Book of, uh, Book of Judges, chapter 13, 21. Back resource. Uh, so I'm I'm almost done, and I, I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, just to give you an idea of for numbers, uh, twelve thousand pages in the complete dictionary. Twelve thousand of those large pages that you saw. Um, so far, I've been running the system in, in beta mode, just with a few volunteers that I personally <coughs> recruited, and they have completed. By which I mean, I've been proofread three times about 300 entries uh, while I was developing the system. Uh, one individual volunteer typed about 450 entries in proof of 1,150 entries. Wait, didn't you just say 300? Yes, I did. Most of those uh, are uh, entries that she has proofread have not yet been proofread a third time. Uh, so that's how these numbers make sense. And once I do publicly launch this, which is, uh, I don't know, I guess in a month or two, uh, I do expect to complete Entire dictionary, I expect a massive volunteer um, uh, participation, and I expect to complete the whole dictionary within two years, which will be the first time it is available to the public. Because I forgot to mention this, this massive comprehensive dictionary has been has been desperately out of print for about 50 years now. It is it, it is only available in university libraries and used bookstores for a small fortune, and so uh, this will be the first time. Hebrew speakers have access to this uh, historical resource. And so what am I going to add to this? Um, I would like links to, uh, to these automatic, all the magical links need to be smarter and smarter and know about more and more resources that are available. Uh, not just on Wikisource, but also on Project Ben Yehuda and HebrewBooks.org. And I would like to be able to export these entries into Wiktionary form. As you may realize, uh, Ben Yehuda uh, lived, the, the author of the dictionary lived uh, a few decades before Wiktionary was invented, and so his, his dictionary definitions don't quite use the templates uh, of Wiktionary. And so we can't just take this and paste it onto Hebrew Wiktionary. We need to um, figure out a way to maybe automatically generate a, a Wiktionary-like uh, interpretation 
of these historical articles, and I'm looking forward to working with the Hebrew missionary community on that. Um, I wrote to the guy, and he answered. <coughs> um, and uh, and um, I, I uh, am also going to use this same system to digitize other right to left dictionaries in Hebrew, and Arabic, and Farsi, etc. I'm very eager to, to see that happen. Some technical details if you're a geek. These are the tools that I've used. Well, if you're that kind of geek, of course, you're a geek. Um, <laughs> these are the tools I've used. It is, of course, free software. Um, the code is available. And if you can read this strange and exotic language, you're welcome to join us uh, in that system. Um, I mentioned Project Ben Yehuda. Uh, Project Ben Yehuda is a volunteer created digital library of public domain Hebrew textual works. Kind of like Project Gutenberg and Project Gutenberg. Hi, Lars. Here? No? Okay. Um, you may know Lars, Wikipedia from Sweden, has also created a digital library uh, of Swedish texts. And it was founded, yes, before Wikipedia, which is one answer to why isn't this on Wikisource, because it didn't exist when I started this project. Uh, and this project has digitized over 9,000 works with 200 active volunteers and enjoys the same kind of retro web design that I'm famous for. <coughs> and. Um, it is in the context of this project, which I founded, that this specific dictionary initiative is happening. But this project has made available a lot of classic Hebrew works, which is why the dictionary will be able to link to those uh, literary works. Uh, thank you, and I would very much like to take questions, and then I can demonstrate the live system that I think is reach out right now.
just if you're interested, if you want to talk about it or show it to someone, etc., just reach out to me. I am user Eon I J O N uh, at Wikipedia. Yeah, this will be simpler. Perhaps I'll have to tweet that link on the uh, Wikimedia 2014. Yeah, hashtag. Yeah, just reach out to me in one of these uh, addresses, and I'll be happy to send you links or answer questions. Thank you. Uh, and this is where there's really a, a symbiotic relationship between libraries 
those sources so that Wikipedia uh, is a starting point and not a dead end for deeper research. So I started the Wikipedia library in 2011. Uh, it started very organically. Credo Reference, uh, which is a, an aggregator of reference works, made a donation to the foundation just, just offhand. Uh, said, we'll give 500 accounts to some editors and you can use those sources on Wikipedia. Um, and it's evolved over the years into a, a much larger program that now has, has five big goals. Um, and the first goal is to help our editors get access to sources they otherwise couldn't afford. Uh, it's just the reality in the current research um, world we live in that a lot of the best sources are paywall, closed access, very expensive and very difficult to get to. Um, and while Wikipedia um, would love to promote open access, and it's one of my personal goals, uh, we have to write an encyclopedia now. And so we have to use sources that are paywalled. And so my mission has been to get editors, uh, I like to say that I would like editors to be armed to the teeth with sources. It drives me crazy that volunteers who want to do nothing but share knowledge cannot access the sources upon which to base the knowledge. So getting access to paywalled sources uh, is a huge goal of the library. Secondarily, that we want to facilitate research for editors so that it's easier for them to find and use sources. We don't want uh, editors to stop at Wikipedia, we want to connect editors to libraries. Um, and we want to kind of encourage editors to use their libraries and the local freely available sources that already, already exist. Uh, and then finally, we do want to promote open access in the long term to promote a vision where all of the research that we would need is free. So our big kind of flagship project is these access partnerships. So kind of like the Wikipedia Zero project, which gets uh, data-free access for mobile. Um, I go to publishers, or my coordinators go to publishers, and we say, basically, um, we would like you to give us 100, 500, 1,000 free accounts to uh, Credo, or JSTOR, or Oxford University Press, and we'll form this mutually beneficial relationship for you because your references will show up on Wikipedia and it will be great for us because we'll have access to sources. Um, and we'll, we'll give the, this free access to top Wikipedia editors, people who are trustworthy, they've been with the community for a year, they've made a thousand edits, um, and then we'll, we'll provide you with some metrics. And also inspired by the Glam model of showing impact, of showing how much did the fact that you gave a donation to editors lead to more uh, references to your sources on Wikipedia and more links back. So how has this been going? Um, so far it's been really, really uh, successful. Um, we've given uh, 2,000 editors, 3,000 accounts. Um, I need to explain this really big number, 1.2 million, um, because it's partly impressive and it's partly uh, a quirk of accounting. Um, libraries typically uh, purchase bundles of subscriptions. And the way that we calculate the value of the donations that we receive is to think about what would this have cost if individual editors had purchased their own subscription. And if that had been the case, um, the accounts from, from the British Newspaper Archives and the Royal Society, they're so phenomenally expensive that it would have cost more than a million dollars to do. Um, but by centralizing it and by kind of acting as uh, as the subscription manager at the library, uh, we're able to, to get a tremendous amount of resources uh, for free. And so we have 15 partners so far, and they're primarily English language sources. Um, we're working to change that, uh, but we have been able to serve about uh, a fifth of our editors uh, are not uh, active on English Wikipedia, they're primarily active elsewhere. And so I, I like to really ask this big question about what it would be like if every single publisher donated free access to say the top 1,000 most active Wikipedia editors in that subject area, what that would mean for Wikipedia, and what would that would mean for exposing the collections of the publisher. Another big program also here with the goal of gaining access, um, borrowed very much from the Glam model of Wikipedians and residents, um, it was suggested to us, or my idea was, well, university libraries already have all these sources. Maybe we can just piggyback on them. Uh, and so in speaking with Peter Super, who's a, an open access advocate, he suggested, well, you know, universities already give free access sometimes to visiting scholars or research affiliates. You know, why not just ask the university if they'll be willing to do that for a Wikipedia editor? Uh, and so, so we tried this. They're, they're different than Wikipedia and, and 
residences because they're unpaid and they're remote. So basically the trade-off is very simple. Uh, a Wikipedia editor gets you know, full access to the online catalog and then they use that access to write Wikipedia articles. That's it. Um, and, uh, and in doing so, there's also an opportunity to act as a liaison between uh, the institution and Wikipedia and to share some. But the, really the key is we're trading access um, for writing about, uh, writing about the sources and the collections that the institution has. So this has been a successful pilot program so far. Um, we've worked with Rutgers, Montana State University, George Mason University, and UC Riverside and um, placed five visiting scholars there. And uh, the kind of basic agreement was, you know, these editors will improve 25 articles over the course of the year, uh, and we'll kind of see how it go, goes. And we'll give the institutions the ability to shape what the topical focus is, so that, uh, you know, Montana State was interested in having editors write about uh, the environment or the history of Montana. And so, you know, we're willing to work with universities to kind of frame and shape uh, within their interests. Um, yeah, so my, my thinking big question here is what would it mean if every university library, every academic institution had a Wikipedia visiting scholar on their staff who was just working, getting free access and working to write articles about the content that those institutions have, and also that those institutions pay a lot of money to have, and very often are under University libraries also have an interest in making sure that their content uh, is exposed and is discoverable, discoverable to the public. Third aspect here is that the Wikipedia library really started on English Wikipedia, and that's because I have an English Wikipedia root and do not have proficiency in other languages, but we have gradually moved towards a model which is more global. So now the Wikipedia library is, ho is housed on uh, Meta rather than English Wikipedia. And we are starting to change the model to one where there's this central Wikipedia library organization, but the English <coughs> language community has its own satellite branch of Wikipedia, which is run by their own community. Um, that offers some of the services that, that we piloted on English Wikipedia, but are kind of adapted to the local context and that are specific to the language. Um, and most importantly, organizationally, are really run by that community. So uh, we started, our first pilot was in Arabic Wikipedia. Um, I'm very, very excited that this is what the Wikipedia li library looks like in Arabic. And I think the Arabic script is much more beautiful than English. Um, I really enjoy it. Um, so on Arabic, uh, we tried something new. We, we offered book purchases. Um, the editors in Arabic Wikipedia there was a demand for books. We asked them, you know, what resources would you want? They said books. And so uh, we set up a book purchase program on Arabic Wikipedia. Um, by the way, it's incredibly difficult to share things to the Middle East. Um, like really, uh, unfortunately difficult. Um, but but that, was a, that was the pilot. And we found two coordinators, two very active uh, Arabic Wikipedia administrators, and said, you know, you can take these pages, this kit that we built, and you can translate them into your language. And we'll, we'll sh kind of give you all the support from the, from the background. But then this will be your library. You'll run this. We'll help you. But this is this is your this is your community's library. Um, so there's book purchases. There's uh, journal signups because any editor from any Wikipedia can sign up for the free access. Um, and then we also included uh, a resource exchange, which I'll talk about in a second, which is a very successful uh, space on English Wikipedia, where basically if I have a source and someone needs it, I can just easily give them a copy of it. Um, so we're working on uh, doing this next in Spanish and German Wikipedia, and anyone here from any language community, we would like to help you set up a Wikipedia library in your community. And really all it takes is two or three people who are interested in supporting it and running it. Um, and, and, and this is this is hugely important to us because uh, you know the product is is limited, it is centrally organized and it's limitless and it's run by each local community. Um, and yeah, so my big question here is what
building tools. Um, so I want to tell you about a specific tool. Uh, OCLC is the largest library cooperative in the world. And they've um, released a new API called the World Cat Knowledge Base API. And so we're working with them to leverage this. And we're trying to create this kind of dream experience where you go to a Wikipedia article, you have this browser extension installed, and then you read something, you go to the references, and you click on the you get down to the references and you're like, gosh, I'd really like to read that. And there's a button next to it that says link to the full text source. And you click the button and you go directly to the full text source. This is like the dream of, of all open access, but we're starting with a kind of narrower scope because, you know, naturally, just because OCLC knows which sources exist in the world doesn't mean you have access to them. But we want to make it easier to get there. So for example, what this tool will do is if you're logged into your university library's um, system, you're on your university's campus, and you have this tool installed, when you click that link, it will use the WorldCat Knowledge Base API to ask your university, do you have access to this source? And if so, it will return a link directly to the full text source. So in that sense, it's kind of acting as an on Wikipedia uh, open URL resolver. If you do not have access to your university, there's a fallback. The next thing it will ask is, is there an open access copy somewhere in the world? Um, and can we return that link to you? So the WorldCat, uh, you know, this is a big challenge, is just cataloging all of the open access sources that exist. WorldCat is doing a pretty decent job incorporating you know, collections like uh, Hots and Trust um, that we can draw from. And hopefully they will add to that over time. And then finally, we want to make, even if we fail, we want to fail gracefully and send people um, to uh, a relevant, uh, excuse me, to a relevant open URL software on an institutional page, or even just in WorldCat, which will have links to search further. We want to make it easier for people to get as close to the full text as possible. We have an alpha version of this up. It's on Tool Labs now. Uh, in order for it to really work, we need to build an instance on Wikimedia Labs so that it uses the unique IP address of each user. There's some privacy issues there that we have to be really careful about. So this is coming out in the next uh, few weeks, uh, if not a few months, if not weeks. And my big question here is what if every single Wikipedia article had a link directly to a full text source right next to it? And then, that you knew before you clicked, would you have access to it or not? Um, I mentioned uh, you know, all this work on, on getting access and getting to sources is great, but there's some really simple just community social solutions here. And English Wikipedia has a, a site called the Resource Exchange. If you're on Wikipedia and you type in WPRX, um, it's, it's just a really simple, it's, it's just like a place to trade sources. And I use it all the time. I'm sure uh, several editors here uh, have. I need access to this JSTOR article, but I don't have access to JSTOR. Can someone email me a copy? Um, and it's, just, it's that very simple person-to-person -person exchange of access. Um, and interestingly, this exists in a bit of a, uh, a legal legal limbo. Um, you know, we, we kind of disclaim on the resource exchange that this is a fair use, that this is academic, non-commercial uh, sharing. Um, but it's very powerful to do it, and so far it hasn't been challenged, it hasn't um, been a problem. And I think it's something that uh, virtually every language community in Wikipedia can benefit from, is just having a place to set up where people can trade access to the sources that they have for the explicit purpose of improving Wikipedia. Um, and there's a really neat potential tie into a tool called the Open Access Button. This is speculative, but the Open Access Button is a tool to kind of announce to the world when you get a paywall, and I just have this wild idea that what if there was a global resource exchange where anytime anyone on the internet hit a paywall, someone else could say, hey, I can help you. I can email you that source if you need it. Um, huge legal questions involved there. It's kind of my wild idea that I think is worth pursuing. So yeah, what if any editor anywhere, anywhere in the world could be given a fair use, full text copy of the source they need right when they need it? Other technical things that we're doing, we're doing work to expose collections of libraries, to help editors connect to reference experts, uh, to leverage some of the metadata that's being collected. There's so much metadata, can we use that to help uh, kind of uh, develop articles? Um, and then finally, can, can we build tools that help us persuade 
partner institutions uh, that it's worthwhile to, to work with Wikipedia. So I'll just show you some quick examples here. This is uh, Wikipedia PLA. Uh, it was a tool that uh, I built with Eric Vanaplace at LibHack, uh, which was at ALA midwinter uh, this January in Philadelphia. So a really, really simple and neat tool. So DPLA is the Digital Public Library of America, and it has, um, it is aiming to have the metadata on every single um, piece of uh, archival material or museum content, uh, text or image or audio in all of the United States. And uh, several different countries have are developing these, these collections, whether it's uh, Europeana or Canadiana or Digital NZ or Trove. And so DPLA has an API. Uh, they just released it. And what this simply does is you install a user script. It's available, or sorry, it was a user script. Now it's a Chrome browser extension. Um, and it creates a little link at the top of any Wikipedia article that says search the DPLA. And if you click the button, uh, it will send a query to the API, and it will return links to images and text that the DPLA holds that's related to the article you're reading. We thought this is a really neat idea to both expose the DPLA's collections, um, but also to lead, hopefully, readers from Wikipedia back to dig into some of these primary sources and this really rich uh, archival material. Um, and we're going to build this with Europeana, and we're hoping to really build it with all of the, the major um, all of the major collections, at least the ones that have an API. Um, this is not my project. I had a little bit of assistance uh, in kind of shaping it, but an, an awesome idea, something we want to do, is connect uh, editors or readers to, to library reference experts. Uh, Liam Wyatt created an, just an awesome project where every Wiki Project Australia template, uh, Liam is at the National Library of Australia, and every uh, Wiki Project Australia talk page template has this link at the bottom. If you need help improving this article? Ask a librarian at the National Library of Australia. And if you click that link, it sends you directly to the reference desk for the inquiry service uh, at the NLA. And I think there's huge potential here to integrate library, uh, Wikipedia articles and reference experts here. Um, we're talking with the National Library of Medicine to do the same for all the medical articles. Um, and there's really just unlimited potential here to do this for any topical area to connect readers or just offer them a way to connect uh, with reference experts back at libraries. Uh, another project is called the Ramp Editor. Uh, this was developed by Timothy Thompson out of the University of Miami. Uh, there was all these great metadata records uh, kind of based on um, authority control and uh, identifiers about people. And there's a lot of rich metadata associated with those identifiers. Um, what Tim did is he built a tool where you can uh, pick information about, uh, in this case it was, um, it was libraries or archives, and you could kind of extract um, the metadata about that archive and it would turn it into a sub article, uh, fully marked up Wikipedia style, so that you could go directly from the metadata to creating a sub article. Um, and so there is so much metadata 
on scheme that means something. So that when you're looking at a reference, you know, is this something that you can read freely? Is this something you can reuse freely? And I think that's really important. And uh, the more that we kind of make visible the openness of things, the more it encourages people to think about open access. And I think this is an intermediate step to, to a world uh, of open access. So yeah, I think it's important that uh, we aim for a situation where every reference is tagged, whether it's free to read or free to reuse. There are lots of uh, potential areas that uh, I'm interested in taking things. I'll just run by kind of a hit list of them. Uh, there, there are way too many to, uh, to actually focus on right now, but maybe someone here wants to run with them. Uh, what if we had a university partnership? What if 10,000 editors got access to the University of Oxford's library? Um, what if you could search from Wikipedia through the uh, World Cat catalog uh, right on Wikipedia to see what books uh, were relevant to something you were researching? Um, what if we had a research desk on Wikipedia where reference experts from the outside library world came and helped answer questions? Um, what if we had integrated uh, citation management tools like EasyBit uh, or Zotero built into Wikipedia to make it easier to keep track of your research? Um, Maybe we could have edit-a-thons at libraries. Maybe we need to do more outreach at libraries, teaching librarians, uh, bringing library professionals into the world through in-person outreach. Um, one particular idea I'm really interested in is all these libraries and universities create subject guides, and each university has a different subject guide, uh, and they don't share them, or maybe they, they archive them somewhere. But what if Wikipedia was the home for collaboratively created subject guides, uh, or bibliographies about subjects? I mean, that's a huge potential area librarians could collaborate and work together on something that otherwise it's a lot of duplicated and sometimes wasted effort. Um, we're interested in getting library interns learning about Wikipedia early on through their education program. Uh, Alex Stinson, Yusuf Sadaz is working on developing that program now, kind of an education program for library interns. Um, and just one last project that uh, we kind of kicked off at ALA Annual in uh, Las Vegas is uh, a way to kind of do plan outreach specifically to archivists show archivists how they can help expose collections through links in further reading sections on Wikipedia articles. I uh, just want to give quick shout outs to um, the interior, uh, to Patrick Early, who's been a great help organizing this. Alex Stinson is not here. Um, the reason this has worked is because you know, I am just surrounded by people who uh, know more about the library world than I do, uh, and who are passionate about um, connecting Wikipedia to that library world. Nikki Maria and Chris Baltieri, uh, Merrily Prophet, who's with OCLC, has been instrumental in helping us reach out to universities. Uh, we've had tech support from Madman, uh, because our emailing bot, and John Unique, and uh, Miche, who is writing the OCLC code. And then globally, we're starting to develop this network of coordinators, um, Abad, um, and uh, Mohammed Ara from Arabic Wikipedia, and Mattis Wang from Chinese Wikipedia, and A. Schmidt, uh, from German Wikipedia, just so many people have been interested in working on this. Um, and we need a lot of help. So if you're interested, please just contact me. Next steps, pretty much just more of what we've been doing this work. Uh, more publishing partners, more visiting scholars, uh, more global satellites, more tech tools, more coordinators, and more outreach. And I just uh, I'd like to end with this thought kind of reinforcing where I started, that Wikipedia and libraries are really very natural allies. And, uh, I think we should aim towards a world where Wikipedia is the starting point for research, um, but then we lead readers back to sources and libraries and help them to think critically about the subjects they're learning about um, and leverage the expertise that library professionals have uh, in helping, helping the world do that. Thank Yeah. 
give stuff away for free to us? Um, and the answer really is, is simply that um, you know their products are only worth are only uh, useful if people see them. And Wikipedia is the primary place where people are going to see them. So it's in their self interest to share content with Wikipedia editors so that it's linked from Wikipedia, these most read articles on the subjects in the world, and it links back to them. We're not, we're not copying the articles and putting them on Wikipedia, but we're summarizing them uh, and then referencing them. And the references link back to the sources. So ultimately, they're giving away something for free in exchange, they're getting a lot more traffic and a lot more visibility. And for libraries specifically, they have a mandate to, to, to disseminate knowledge and to share their collections. And if Wikipedia is where the world is going to do their research, then they kind of are obliged to find a way to get their content on Wikipedia. larger 
more sustainable and just, I don't know, it's a much sexier model when people do stuff 